turning this evening to the book of the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 14 and verse 3. And our subject this evening is a question. Are we secret idolaters? This verse reads, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of at all by them? Well, these words are addressed or referred to some of the elders of Israel who came before the prophet Ezekiel. They professed to fear God. They came to the prophet inquiring, seeking guidance and blessing and instruction. And yet they were going to receive short shrift from the Lord through the prophet and their prayers would not be taken seriously. Some of us here this evening may have unanswered prayers. Especially, some of us may have unanswered prayers regarding the salvation of our souls. We have sought forgiveness from God, an assurance that he has received us and will bless us. We hear of others who could speak with great certainty of a time when they were made different, when their hearts were touched, when the whole of their lives and priorities were transformed, when they came to know deep peace and assurance that God had received them and forgiven them, and we have asked for these things and yet felt nothing. It may be that like these elders of Israel, we are secret idolaters. Well, here is a reminder in this very verse that God looks at our hearts when we approach him. He knows what is going on in our heart, whether there is that superficial readiness to bow the knee before him, and yet our hearts really are set upon idols, other things. Well, I want to explore this theme this evening, and I hope profitably, and in a way that will challenge, but also encourage us to see that our best interests are served when we renounce all the idols that our society fixes its affection and attention on, and we focus upon the Lord Jesus Christ. He is worthy of the greatest affection and adoration and trust of our hearts. Well, these, are, these elders may have been hypocritical inquirers, giving the impression of being earnest, and yet really being far from the Lord. Or they may have been so deceived that they did not fully appreciate that they were guilty of idolatry. And perhaps that may be the case with some of us this evening. We do not realize just how the idols of this present world and society have stolen our affections. And the Lord sees. And for that reason, he may have withheld an answer to that prayer for salvation. Now these elders perhaps are to be contrasted with the lying antics of the prophetesses referred to in the previous chapter. I want to just look at these prophetesses because they present a picture which is most stark and most solemn. And such people still exist today. We may have read this together and wondered what on earth the Lord was saying. In verse 18 of chapter 13, he says, Woe to the women that sew pillows to armholes and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt souls. Well, the picture here is of providing a false comfort 
people may lay down on a bed of thorns, but it's not very comfortable. But to be provided with a pillow, it's a picture of comfort, isn't it? But the Lord is saying here to these false prophetesses, you've metaphorically provided a pillow for the wicked to rest their head upon. And they lay down with ease. They go through life comforted and assured that even though they are living wickedly and carelessly, and though their lives are an offense to the Lord, yet they are encouraged in their godless life. Look at verse 22. He says, with lies, you have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad. But with lies, you have strengthened the hands of the wicked that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. Friends, there are false prophets today who do exactly that. They say, in effect, in some churches, you can just live as you like. But so long as you pay lip service to Jesus Christ, all will be well when you come to die. It's no wonder that some of the churches of England are full of empty pews because the message that goes forth is so long as you turn up for your wedding or for a christening or for an occasional Easter service, you need not fear. God is a God of love and kindness. That's no different to the message here. It is sowing pillows and putting them under armholes, giving people a false comfort. Do you know what the prophet says here? about such a message, he says, you're hunting the souls of my people. You're making a prey of them. You're leading them to slaughter and to ruin. The Lord had so much to say to such. Previously, in chapter 13, he'd addressed the false prophets and he described the false prophets as building a wall and then daubing it with untempered mortar. A wall that would fall down flat with the puff of a storm of hail. What's the picture? The false prophets, similarly to the false prophetesses, were giving a message of false security. Oh, we're okay. We've got a wall around us. We can feel protected and assured. And this is so often the tragedy, not only in the days of Ezekiel, but the days that we live in too. The message that many hear is a message of false peace, where there is no peace, says the prophet Ezekiel, of false comfort. It may well be in the context of that warning that he then turns to these elders who perhaps came to him and said, yes, but we're not the false prophets. We're not the false prophetesses. They came before the Lord and the prophet is Ezekiel is instructed to say to them words equally stern. Is any of us here? We're here tonight sincerely and we sort of say, well, we've not been carried away by the foolish talk of some of those who claim to be religious in our society. Oh no, we, we believe in God. Well, the message here then is, are we false idolaters? Are we secret idolaters? We can never fool God if that is the case. Look at the language here. And then I want to get on to something more positive a little later on. Son of man, that's God addressing Ezekiel. These men have set up their idols in their heart. This phrase here, to set up an idol. It means to enthrone, to cause the idol to ascend onto the heart. The implication here is quite significant. God, as our creator, sets up the seat of his empire in the heart. That's where he has a claim. He, lay claim, he lays claim to the very seat of our affections 
and our decision making and our thought life. That's what is meant by the heart here. But the prophet says, the place that is rightfully God's has been taken away. God is dethroned. An idol is set up, enthroned in its place. And anything that dethrones God in our lives is an idol. Are you a secret idolater then? Am I? It's a question we have to ask. Anything in our lives that becomes so important that it commands our loyalties, it invites our chief love and affection and attention that dictates our priorities, our thought life, our desires, that sets the very agenda and perspective of life. Anything that our life revolves around that isn't God is in danger of being an idol. It may be wealth and possessions. We can make an idol of our home or of our dream home. It may be a pastime, a sport, a game, a computer game. These things can all become so dominant in our lives that they command our best thoughts and our first thoughts. And we revolve our whole life around these things that have become so important to us. And the Lord looks and said, that person, that young man, that young woman, they've set up an idol in their heart. The, the worst idol of all is self. Self-love. The Apostle Paul said to Timothy in the last days, men shall be lovers of their own selves. It's all over social media, isn't it? Particularly young women who are so obsessed with their own self-image, what people think of me, what they will write about me, how many likes I will get. The idol is self. I want people to praise me and admire me and worship me. And the whole of my thinking is determined by creating that image. And I hope people are going to like me. It's an idol. It's taken the place of God. It may be a business. It may be a person. It may be a family. These things become, they take the wrong place in our lives. And so long as my family is successful and my children do well at school and they get on in life, I'm happy. I don't think too much about God and what God thinks of me so long as all these things are in order. It's become an idol. It may be a system of belief. We idolize a particular system of belief. It's our own opinions, our own ideas about what's right and what's good and what's important. But it's not what God commands and teaches. We say in effect with these things, or we may do if they've become an idol, I look to you to be the source of my happiness and fulfillment and joy. I cannot be happy without these things, these pleasures, these business successes, these dream homes. They are what really matter to me above anything else. The Lord reads our hearts, friends, and if we have yielded to such idolatry, then the message of these verses is that God will not hear our prayers. You know what this word idol means? It's intriguing, really, because in the original Hebrew, it comes from a word meaning a log, a log of wood. You can see why, can't you? Because in those days, people used to take a log of wood, they'd set it up, they would carve an image upon it, and it would be then elevated in their imagination, in their thoughts, it would become the object of devotion. But it's really no more than a log, an object. Well, we can understand. We see through these ancient idols and deities. And yet we so often 
do not realize that we are guilty of making earthly things our own idols. And we devote our lives to them. The, apostles, uh, the, the prophet says here, secondly, he says, they have put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. And this is almost certainly a reference to the fact that when God is on the throne of our hearts, his law is before our face. What he commands, his way, his charted pathway through life, it's set before the person, the child of God, who loves him. The child of God says, what does God have me to do? How we, would he have me live? How would he have me think? What are the standards by which I am to live? But when we yield to idolatry, then we tear away God's laws and God's standard for life. We replace it with our own agenda and our own ideas, and it becomes the stumbling block. In Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 21, you needn't turn to it. This is what we read. My son, let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. He's speaking about God's laws, God's commandments. So shall they be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck. Then shalt thou walk in thy way safely and thy foot shall not stumble. The believer, the God-fearing person that has God's law before them, they will not stumble. But those who yield to idolatry, this verse says, you put a stumbling block before your face. We'll come back to that in a moment. What are the consequences of idolatry? The prophet is commanded by God to spell them out here. Firstly, it's a barrier to seeking God. Should I be inquired of at all by them? Verse 3. Secondly, it estranges us from God. Verse 5. They are estranged from me through their idols. God regards us as foreigners. He sets us at a distance. He deals with his own people. He favors them, guides them, blesses them. But once we yield to some idol, we make ourselves as foreigners, outsiders to his commonwealth and his care. It's a solemn thing to set up an idol in our heart for that reason. But thirdly, here, it will become a stumbling block. A trip hazard. That's what the word means. You set up a a self-imposed trip hazard in your life. That business, that dream, that game or pastime that's become so, so much of an obsession in your life, it will be a stumbling block. Can you imagine someone building a home and they get that home just as they like and then the door between the kitchen and the living room, you deliberately put a big step, a trip hazard. It doesn't need to be there, but you put it there three inches high, and every time you walk through, unwittingly, you trip on it. You stumble over. What a foolish thing it would be to do something like that. Well, that's the picture here. When we allow something to get such a hold of us, when it becomes an obsession, a distraction in our lives from the things of God, it's like having a massive stumbling block in our life. It will keep tripping us up. It will cause harm and difficulty in our lives. King David said in Psalm 119, verse 165, Great peace have they which love thy law. Nothing shall offend them. The word offend, it's the same word. Nothing will be a stumbling block to them. When we set God before our thoughts, when we set his law before our minds, then we shall not stumble. But when we allow some alternative 
earthly possession or pleasure or person even to become the focus of our affections instead of God, it will trip us up. It will be a stumbling block. God alone is worthy of our highest esteem. It's not written here in these verses, but that's the implication, isn't it? God in the person of Jesus Christ is to be enthroned in our hearts. He is to be the chief object of our love and of our devotion. He is worthy to command and direct our lives. We look to him for peace, for joy, for satisfaction. But whenever we have an idol in our life, we are rejecting Jesus Christ and saying, I would have rather have these earthly pastimes and pleasures. I would rather hold dear my own opinions and ideas than yield to the Savior. I want to think about the Lord Jesus Christ in this context because compared to the idols that so many in our society allow their lives to be dictated by, Jesus Christ is the most excellent and most glorious and most worthy object of our love and esteem. There are seven ways in which I want us to think just briefly about Jesus Christ. And surely Eve, every one of these would shout at us and say, leave the idols and come to Jesus Christ. Firstly, we think of what he said to Philip in John chapter 14. I am the way. In a sense, it's an open-ended statement, isn't it? I am the way. Later on, he would say, no man comes to the Father but by me. That's chief and uppermost in the mind of Christ when he made that statement. Would you have God as your God? Would you come under his care? Would you know his pardoning love? Would you be at peace with God? Would you have God to be your God to guide you, to overrule in your life, to bring you at last to glory? Then you must come to Jesus Christ. I am the way, he said. Then surely no idol in this world, no person, no human opinion, no possession, no pleasure, no sport can ever bring you to God, but Jesus Christ can. Then we think secondly, he said, I am the truth. The previous chapter, as we've already noticed, was a, a, a litany of lies catalogued by the prophet, rebuking those that hunted their souls. And you know, in any sense, every idol that we may embrace, to a certain extent, it's a lie. It deceives us. It says, if you have me, you can be happy. You can know fulfillment. You can know joys. You don't need anything else but me. It's a lie. Because the things of this world can never reach our deepest needs. But Jesus Christ is the truth. He's the truth, firstly, in that he is the real deal, the real thing. To have Christ is to have the way in which our deepest needs can be met. Peace with God, sins forgiven, a place in heaven. But he also is the truth in that what he reveals and what he speaks in his word brings reality and truth to our understanding. We cannot understand the purpose of life. We cannot see what our lives are all about, except first we yield to Jesus Christ. Would you have an idol? Would you be sold the lie that an idol is? Or would you have Christ? Have him who is the Son of God as your saviour and friend, who died for you and who will speak for you in heaven to come. 
Surely Jesus Christ is worthy of our affection. He should be enthroned upon our heart. All idols should be rejected. Thirdly, he says, I am the life. These things are linked together. There's no life worth living without Jesus Christ at the head. To have Christ is to have and to experience life on a new dimension. How many in this world are filled with fear, the uncertainty of their future, but to have Christ is to know that all is well for time and for eternity. We have him who is life as our friend and death can never overcome us. We may die, but death will have no power to ruin us if we have Christ who is our life. Then we can think, fourthly, that Christ is wisdom. Who would be a fool? But the prophet says, Jesus Christ is made unto you wisdom. It is the path of, of, that is right and good, like truth, righteousness. It's our biggest problem, isn't it, sin? Guilty before God, our conscience accuses us, tells us you are not right with God. Your sin is enough to condemn you eternally. But to have Christ is to be made righteous before God, to be clothed such that we are counted spotless, well-pleasing in his sight. Can you imagine what it must be for God to look upon us and be as pleased with us as he is with his own dear son, in whom has no tr is no sin? And yet that is the gift of salvation. It is to be counted righteous before God, to have that snowy dress of his pure life counted to be ours. Sanctification, that's the sixth aspect of Christ. He's made the source of sanctification to make us holy, to deal with those deep-rooted sins in our lives that distort our character and that render us ugly in the sight of God, to grow in grace, to be made like Christ himself. These are great and mighty things. Lastly, in Christ is redemption. And when Paul speaks of that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, he means that eternal redemption, which is yet to come. That day when Christ will appear and receive his people and claim them as his own and show himself as the captain of their salvation when we shall be done with sin completely in all its polluting effects, in all its consequences, in all the pain, the misery, the sickness, the suffering that it causes to be redeemed, ransomed from all that misery. That's Christ. Then would you not have Christ instead of the idols that so often capture our affections here below, I must move on. The idols that so often we cling to in life have the power to ruin us. Are they worthy of our trust? Examine your soul this evening. Do you sacrifice time and attention to alternatives to God? Has God been dethroned? Are other things setting the agenda of our lives? Then here is the message of the Lord. Look at verse 6. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Repent, and turn yourselves from your idols, and turn away your faces from all your abominations. Abominations here is a reminder to us that's what idols are in the sight of God. They're disgusting. That's what the word means. When we exalt self and imagine we are so important and that our will is more important than God's will, that our desires are more important than what God would have us be, 
is disgusting to God. That's what the word abomination means here. There's a call to repentance three times in this verse. Repent and turn yourselves. That's the same word translated in our Bibles differently. Turn yourselves from your idols and turn away your faces. Repent, repent, repent. That's the message of the Lord through the prophet here. You say, what does that mean? Well, it begins with confession. We have to see idolatry for what it is. I quoted this morning William Cowper or Cooper, the dearest idol I have known, whate'er that idol be, help me to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. He knew that there were things in his life which usurped the place of Jesus Christ and of God. And it grieved him. Does it grieve you to know that you have made earthly things, earthly pleasures and possessions more important? You think about them more often. You would be more grieved to lose them than grieving the God who has made you and calls you to himself. You say, oh Lord, I see that this is a great idol. I confess that sin of idolatry. But more than that, repentance is a turning away from sin unto God. But more than that, repentance involves a calling upon God for help. Idols are so entrenched in our hearts that we cannot rid ourselves of them. We are so prone to these things. We are so easily befooled by earthly things that capture our attention. And therefore we have to cry unto the Lord and say, Lord, only you can break the snare of idolatry in my life. Take away the love of idols. If we turn to chapter 36, you needn't turn with the, to me to these verses, but this is still Ezekiel chapter 36. Listen to what he says. Thus saith the Lord, I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Here is the promise of God to those that seek. The Lord says, I will cleanse you from your idols. He will take away that love of these things from our heart. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. What a promise is there. Washed from our sin, sprinkled with clean water, a new heart given to us. There's the gospel in a nutshell. That's the promise of Jesus Christ when he said, come unto me, I am the way. The way to life. Will you come to the Lord? Repentance is turning from sin from idolatry to the Lord. In one sense, we cannot do it. The Lord must turn us. The Lord must work within us. And yet this verse exhorts us. Turn from your idols. Turn, turn, turn. We turn then to the Lord, realizing that only he, or with his help, through his spirit, can we be made new. And be given a heart that gladly receives Jesus Christ. Enthroned, loved, served, yielded to, trusted, owned as king, owned as prophet, owned as saviour. Will you turn? Turn to the Lord and say, oh Lord, I know that my heart is a wretched heart, a sinful heart, prone to wonder prone to love foolish things, 
But Lord, work with him. Give me that new heart, that clean heart. Cleanse away all my guilt. Deal with me graciously. And make me a true child of God. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, we thank thee for the warnings of thy word. We confess that like so many in Ezekiel's day and so many in our own day, we are prone to set our affection upon things below, to love, to focus our attention and our interests upon the vanities of pleasures and possessions. But we realize that Jesus Christ alone is worthy of our love and of our confidence. Move us to repentance. Do a mighty work in every heart here this evening that has never known that work as yet, that we may be made new and made the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask in his name. Amen. We close this evening with 400.